I named the title of my talk Owning It. Um, I just thought it was kind of a funny, you know, phrase to turn around, but it has a couple of important meanings uh, in terms of type design and intellectual property. Uh, so to break it down, uh, the first meaning is the literal ownership. So uh, you're making this thing, who gets to own it? Um, in lots of cases, uh, the fonts are uh, proprietary to the client, uh, but in many others, there's a period of exclusivity after which type designers can release the work. And the second point, and you hear this a lot these days, especially uh, with custom typefaces, is the, the idea of ownability, um, point of differentiation uh, between the typeface that a company is investing in and all of the other options that are already out there. And the third is the kind of you know, tongue in cheek owning it, um, just kind of taking pride in what you've got, not apologizing, owning it. So for those three reasons, I thought uh, it, it, it was a good topic. Um, you know, uh, ownership is an important, an important topic in, in this field. So I'm going to break the, break the talk down basically into two sections. First, um, some history. Uh, which is a little new for me. I'm usually just showing my own work, uh, but I thought this was a great opportunity to dive a little deeper and look at what the history of custom typefaces really is. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll just talk about myself for a little while. Um, so I'm not a type historian. Um, Stephen, if I get anything wrong, just you know, shout out the right date or you know, uh, correct me. Uh, so these are really just, it's, it's a personal history. These are projects that have influenced me and that are meaningful uh, to me. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, Peter Behrens and the work uh, specifically that he did for AEG. Uh, he was a German designer, um, came of age right around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, a lot of his early work was very influenced by Art Nouveau. So you know, this poster here, or this is actually the door to his house, uh, which he also designed. He was also an architect, an engineer, a product designer, the father of German industrial design. These are all in the collection of MoMA, no big deal. Uh, but as a graphic designer, you may have, uh, you may be most familiar with this, uh, his logo for AEG, which is the, I'm gonna butcher this, but Allgemeine Elektrizitats Gesellschaft. Uh, they were a company in Germany, in Berlin, that made electrical equipment, air turbines, as well as consumer goods. And uh, Peter Behrens was the designer behind um, all of their really great work. Uh, the company was founded in 1883, sold to Daimler-Benz in 1985, uh, but a lot of this work is still around, including in the collection of MoMA. So the work that he did for them, and this is you know, one of the most beautiful examples of the identity program, you know, not only is he the father of um, German industrial design, but also this is the first corporate identity program in terms of consistent, um, easily recognizable brands. It wasn't always like this, and it was really groundbreaking uh, to have this consistent approach for illustration, this consistent uh, look of typography. And so he was not only you know, coming up with that system, he also drew the letters, uh, we're led to believe. It's not totally clear, but you know, I did some research prior to this, came across uh, what appear to be his drafts of uh, the lettering and the, the way that they were used. So these are um, a lot of the advertisements, the posters uh, that were used for AEG. Um, he was also a published type designer. Uh, so this is Baron's Schrift and Baron's Antiqua, which were both published. And uh, he designed this factory. Um, actually designed the entire building, as well as the lettering on the front. Um, and that lettering on the facade, apparently still there in Berlin today. Um, and it's beautiful. So that's really the first um, custom typeface uh, for a corporation. Uh, as well as the first corporate identity that I'm aware of. would love to hear any others if people know of them. The next uh, project that I want to talk about is Times New Roman, uh, which was produced by Monotype. And the story goes, 
1932, the London Times underwent a design. And while this wasn't the first custom typeface for publication, that distinction appears to go to Century Roman by Lynn Boyd Benton for Divini Century Magazine. But I've chose to focus on this because it has a much better story. So uh, Stanley Morrison, the type director, I'm not sure what his position was, for Monotype, commissioned this and worked with Victor Lardent um, at the Times, who was a uh, designer artist there, uh, to produce the letters. <clears throat> And what we have here on the left is the, um, the, the existing typeface that they were using for text, and on the right is Times New Roman. Times had a larger X height, sharper details, narrower pro proportions, and was apparently inspired by Monotype Plantin, uh, which was a 1913 release. Um, you know, but to modernize, and part of this is just a Times New Roman bias because we've seen it so much, on the right feels a little strange as a newspaper face. On the left, this is a bit, this is, you know, maybe we've just returned to form uh, more what we expect as a new newspaper face, although it's a little bit wide. It's not so different than um, Imperial, the uh, typeface they used for the New York Times uh, for text. And this was the first usage in 1932. Um, you may notice there's lots of drop caps, apparently no headlines. Um, I was surprised to see this, but this is what's uh, shared on the Monotype um, site as the first homepage. And then they published it in 1932, uh, or actually I'm not sure when they published it. The, the, the commission was in 1932. It went on to be the most successful metal font in Monotype history, and um, that's the end of the story. Or is it? Uh, in 1994, Mike Parker, formerly of Linotype, produced an article with a radical claim that no, Stanley Morrison and Victor Lardin were not the originators of Times New Roman, but rather it was this guy, William Starling Burgess, uh, who designed it in 1904 and you know, almost 30 years prior to that commission and somehow was erased from history. A little bit about uh, William or Starling Burgess. He was a yacht builder, a poet, an aviation engineer, and a type designer. Uh, so similar to Peter Behrens, very accomplished in all these different areas. The way the story goes is that, um, I'm not sure his first name, Giampa, uh, who was a colleague of Mike Parker, found evidence of, Lance, he, he purchased Lanston Monotype's archive in 1987, found evidence of this, and shared it with Mike Parker, they worked with Matthew Carter to digitize it. That's what we see at the bottom here, is a digi digitization of the only existing evidence of Lanston 54, which, you know, as the story goes, went on to become Times New Roman. But the whole story is wrapped in mystery and unfortunate circumstances. Uh, the evidence of Burgess's drawings were lost in a fire in his factory. Uh, Giampa's documentation was lost when his house flooded. The only known printed record, records of these drawings is at the Smithsonian, which is now quarantined for asbestos contamination. So it's just like this, this thing where no one can really know what it is. All we have is this very lengthy article that Mike Parker made. So here it is, one Roman weight, a sketch of a few italic characters, but there is some additional evidence which uh, points in the direction that this could be a true story. Uh, Monotype pitched the typography for the launch of Time magazine in 1923, and Lanson 54, this, you know, the Burgess design, was used. Um, and I forgot to say, so uh, Burgess uh, submitted um, his design to Lanson Monotype, and uh, that's how it became um, something they were using. Um, his article is exhaustive in detail. Uh, here we've got, you know, in these four lines, uh, plantain at the top, and then Lanston number 54, then uh, the design that was made for Time Magazine, and then Time's New Roman. And to look a little bit closer, uh, focusing on the second and the fourth line, the Lanston, the Starling Burgess, and the Time's New Roman, these things are almost, um, almost indistinguishable. The details are incredi incredibly close. Lowercase as well. And as I said, it is a huge article. 
Um, I'm about a third of the way through it, but you know, I'm going to keep going, read it before bed. Uh, you know, there's no definitive proof. Monotype denies it. Um, it's possible that Parker made all of this up. He could have just been a merry prankster, but geez, what a lot of work to, uh, you know, put forth this story. Anyways, it's a fun backstory for this font, but the reason that most of us know Times New Roman is because it was packaged with uh, Windows ever since uh, version 3.1, and it become, became the default font for uh, Microsoft Word. So up until 2007, it was, oh, you can't see the gray background. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was the default font, and so that's why we have all of these legal briefs, resumes, uh, menus and restaurants, it's just everywhere. And so, although the design itself has merit, it's, it's not a poorly designed font, we're just so habituated to it, and its use has been so mediocre in terms of, uh, you know, this undesigned presentation, that now we're just immune to it, and um, it doesn't even feel like a designed uh, typeface anymore. But don't worry. Um, both Colophon and Font Bureau have released their own uh, revivals of Starling Burgess's designs. On the left, this is Burgess uh, by Colophon. On the right, Starling by Font Bureau. So happy ending to the story. We get to talk about them 100 years later. Um, the next project I want to talk about is uh, Edward Johnston's London Underground, which really is the first, um, as I'm aware of, the, the first custom typeface for a corporation in the sense that we think of, in terms of you know, a consistent font that was used um, uh, systematically, whereas a AEG was really a, a collection of letters that were uh, employed in different illustrative ways. So along with Rudolf Koch, um, Edward Johnson is considered the father of modern calligraphy. Uh, he was truly a master of um, you know, the written form. And he worked with London Underground prior to his commission. This is what their communications looked, for, looked like, very um, inspired by the arts and crafts movement. And he wanted to make a sans serif uh, typeface that would reflect the modern age. Uh, you know, certainly wasn't the first sans serif typeface. That distinction goes to Caslon from 1816, followed later by Figgins in 1832 and a whole slew of other sans serif typefaces, but what makes, what makes Johnson Underground special is that he really married the rhythm and the, um, the craft behind calligraphy with uh, this geometric sans serif design. And he wrote extensively about his ideas about these things. This is you know, a diagram of his thoughts about the way the uh, sans serif letters should be constructed. Uh, this is the draft of Johnson Underground, and you know, lots of nice little notes in his perfect penmanship in the middle. Um, and a later uh, production drawing of uh, the Underground Roundel, um, which became the, the the symbol for the Underground. And after this this program was um, after after it started being used, these are the sorts of illustrations and. Uh, consistent use of typography that uh, the underground was was employing. So, although to us it's this still feels old-fashioned, it's quite modern in comparison to the arts and crafts uh, posters that they were using previously. Just a couple of other examples of the font in use. This is one of the first um, London Underground uh, maps of this design by uh, I'm not sure his first name Beck in 1933. And just to look at the the evolution of the roundel over the years. Uh, you know, in the middle, that's his actual um, Edward Johnson's design. It was redesigned several times since, but it still uh, includes that, that element of his original design. Still in use today, uh, including in this beautiful image here, uh, and Johnson wasn't commercially available. And so, as I'll mention next, Gil Sands ended up becoming much more popular and used in some places. So Eric Gill, a student and colleague of Edward Johnston, uh, experimented with an even simpler design, and that's how we ended up with Gil Sands. This, this essay is talking about the uh, apparent benefits of Gil Sands over 
Johnson Underground, and that's debatable, but we certainly see a lot of uh, Gil Sands these days. Uh, two books that I would recommend uh, if you'd like to learn more about Edward Johnson is that his um, his his uh, document of uh, formal pen penmanship on the left, and then a great book that I just picked up about Johnson and Gill uh, by Mark Ovenden. Another project, uh, this is the last um, custom font uh, history lesson that I want to talk about. And it was really a special or an important one for me uh, as I was starting to learn about graphic design, uh, which is the Mobile Oil Program by Chermayev and Geismar. So prior to the redesign, this is what the mobile ads looked like, um, you know, and they, um, <laughs> sorry, the, uh, the Tremayf and Geismar design uh, took this very geometric approach to the letter forms, and it was inspired by um, the, these designs by Elliot Noyce. He designed, he was a very prominent architect who designed the, uh, the service stations uh, with these, these circular forms, as well as the, the fuel pumps that they were using at the time. The idea behind the mobile typeface was to marry the geometry of Futura with the even proportions of, of standard, or as we know it, accidents grotesque today. And, and the way it was applied was beautiful. It was consistent, uh, clean, modern, certainly very stark in difference to the ad that I showed you just a moment ago. So this is the full alphabet uh, and the numbers. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a whole lot online. Uh, you know, these are some of the only images that, that I really found uh, to document the, the mobile program. So I took a drastic measure that I would recommend to all students and I emailed Tom Geismar. I figured out what his email address was, mm -hmm. I sent him a message, and he wrote back to me. And that's something that I've done quite a few times over my career, and it's really paid off. You know, The worst thing that somebody can do is not reply to you, and uh, you won't get a 100% rate of return. But in general, designers are nice people, and they will make time for you. So to students in the audience, I really recommend reaching out to people if there's something you want to know. So I had a lovely conversation with Tom Geismar this morning, and he sent me a bunch of images. So now we can supplement what I've previously shown you with a couple more images. This is from the very first uh, presentation to mobile, uh, where they're showing how the program works, the application of the alphabet. And you know, it was, it was a pretty novel idea, this sub-brand um, usage of a single typeface and then using the same font uh, after the brand name to uh, create these sub-brands. The first um, uh, oil can uh, designs, uh, the, pack the way it was employed on the packaging, um, and actually we have a copy of the, the original standards manual for mobile. So just a couple more images of that. And this was the very first of the new mobile um, service stations. This was in Connecticut. And they, not many of these are around anymore because in these days, uh, they only had the one grade of gas. So they were single, single pumps. And in, then 20 years later, they uh, worked with Elliott Noise again to create the modern uh, service station, which really hasn't changed that much ever since uh, with the multiple grades of gas uh, Self-service was now an option. And, uh, you know, all of that, uh, I was able to get a little more information about the project just by reaching out to someone. And it was a lot better than the images that I found online, which still are, you know, using the font uh, pretty consistently. So those are a couple of examples that, you know, have been important to me in terms of how custom type has been used throughout time. Uh, a little bit more recent examples uh, still very important. Most of us have heard, you know, the Port Authority bus terminal, this vernacular lettering is what inspired Tobias Fred Jones to create Gotham, uh, which was originally used for uh, GQ magazine, and then obviously has gone on to do lots of other things. Um, uh, a famous application was the Obama campaign in 2008. Another Heffler uh, design from uh, 2001, uh, Archer, this was originally commissioned by Martha Stewart Living, uh, was exclusive to them for a period of time and then was released later. 
One more example, the Guardian typeface by Commercial Type, Christian Schwartz and Paul Barnes. These are all examples of fonts that have found a home in a corporate or publishing um, usage that then that, that gets developed, that gets supported, gets rolled out, and then after a period of time becomes available to, to other designers. And I think there's real benefit in that, that there's something sad about a custom, a custom typeface that's only used once. Uh, a brand can then go through a redesign, and if the designer doesn't have any rights to it, that font never goes on to do anything else. So as designers living in the modern world with access to social media, you've probably been hearing a lot about some custom typefaces. Uh, you know, the sad reality is that for a lot of companies, this is a financial decision. Enterprise licenses from some of the bigger foundries can be incredibly expensive, not only in a one-time fee, but in an annual fee. So there's a desire to have custom fonts, and there's also this desire to own them. This has resulted in a lot of companies commissioning custom typefaces, and I'll show you a couple of notable recent examples of them. But the other thing I want to say is that, you know, custom fonts have become even more important because our typographic world is just much bigger than it ever was before. When I first started designing fonts, uh, print was really the only way that you were going to use a font. Um, web fonts weren't around yet, uh, let alone app fonts. Now, there's even examples of fonts being used in virtual reality. Uh, the sky's really the limit, and there's just so many new ways that companies are interacting with um, their audience. Uh, and type is the primary uh, medium for communicating with their, their audience. So this is uh, TCC Unity, a uh, custom typeface for Coca-Cola by Neville Brody and Associates. And it's a finely executed font. The one thing I want to point out is that there's a problem when the marketing department gets a hold of your story and they start telling the general audience uh, some details about the font. So we end up with things like teardrop counter follows the language of brand and liquid, whatever that means. Um, I can kind of go along with the slice T evokes the hyphen, but the Q looking like a glass with a straw, sure, maybe they all do. It's just not necessarily that useful of a story to tell, but I get it. Um, you know, I have clients, people love a story, and that's really what can sell the idea through. Uh, when it comes to the marketing department, though, maybe let's, you know, fine tune the message a little bit. A bit better, uh, the, the way the Netflix sand story is told, but still we're hearing about the cinematic curve and enhanced geometry. Not sure what exactly that means. You know, these are well-designed fonts. They're just explained in, in kind of a convoluted way. Um, Airbnb just came out with their custom font. They went a lot safer with just describing tall X height, open aperture, call today. Uh, but the most recent, um, uh, or actually not even that most recent, it was 2017 that it first came out, but most notable custom typeface um, of recent uh, news for me was this IBM Plex font uh, by Mike Abink and Bold Monday for IBM. What's notable about it is not only its beautiful form, but the way that they've chosen to make it available to everyone. So there's an open font license, you can download these fonts from GitHub, you can use them however you like, and you know, rather than saying these are ours and we're going to own them and no one else can have them, they're saying these are ours and you can use them in new and interesting ways, but they've been drawn in a way and, uh, and, and thought of in a way that still makes them ownable to IBM in terms of the ideas. So it goes on to have another meaning, but the IBM DNA is still there. All right, that concludes uh, talking about other people, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my own work. Um, so, as James mentioned, my first font was a font called Router. I was living in New York at the time. Uh, in 2006 was when I first started working on it. Uh, it was a moment of inspiration in this subway station, uh, 33rd Street and Park Avenue. You know, as a designer living in New York, I had been taking photos of type for some time. But on this particular day, I saw this sign. And there was just something that caught my eye. The, um, this charming A with the tail, this eight that curved back on itself, um, a lot of details that I thought were really great. 
And what made it seem fair game to me to use as inspiration for a font was that this was a piece of lettering. It wasn't an existing typeface, although uh, it, it appears to have been you know, uh, inspired by Helvetica or based on Helvetica. You can see that the ease and ejector and emergency are different widths. These have been done by hand. Um, all of the other letters are slightly different. So I started drawing. And at first, you know, it was just getting familiar with the tools. I was working in Illustrator at the time, and I was incredibly, um, you know, uh, prescriptive in terms of following the, following the source material. I was really just tracing it. And this is in the days before Type at Cooper. I actually signed up for a class at Cooper Union, a custom typeface design class. The day before the class was to start, I received a call and was told that the class was canceled because I was the only person that signed up for it. <clears throat> and so, uh, similar to you know deciding to reach out to Tom Geismar, I wrote, reached out to the instructor, a guy named Hannes Vamira. And for the next six months, I went to his apartment once a week and was tutored. Uh, he taught me the design program. We uh, looked at proofs of my typeface and marked them up, just as you see here. And that's really my introduction to um, type design. I never went to one of the graduate programs that I thought about it. Um, I just uh, learned by doing and just kept working and uh, kept going that way. So at a certain point into the prod into the um, you know, education in type design. I came up with this draft, and it was a difficult conversation. But Hannes told me, you know, you've you've made this font, you've stripped all the personality out of it. Uh, I could just use some other font that already exists, and there's no reason for this font to be. Uh, every font has to have a a mission statement. There needs to be a reason to exist. So while that was hard feedback, it was it was necessary. Uh, it's something that I take to heart and I you know, think about still. I went back to my source material and noticed that when the router was uh, carving the letters out of plastic, there was kind of an, uh, a stress point at the beginning and end of the strokes. So I made that the defining characteristic of the font. And so here's the final version of router. And you can see that these, there are these swellings at the end of the strokes. And so that's what I made the font about. And uh, that's what gave it its you know, special characteristic. There's also an italic. And uh, I did a full weight range. <clears throat> so I published that in 2008. And not too long after, I uh, was pleasantly surprised to see that people had started to buy it. Uh, and this was the first big usage of router uh, for the Minute Maid redesign by Duffy and Partners. And it's not, you know, super prominent, but it's on there, orange and 100%. That's the font I drew. <clears throat> I was happy. Um, and as James, James mentioned, then uh, not long after, uh, it was included in this uh, design exhibition at the Walker Art Center and then at the uh, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. And around the same time, I got a call, or I was getting emails one morning, uh, pick up the New York Times on a Sunday, and it had been used in a special education issue of the New York Times. So, you know, as a graphic designer, I wasn't working at type top agencies or doing work that was, you know, uh, getting national exposure. And suddenly, as a type designer, I had found something that I enjoyed more that was opening more doors for me and was starting to uh, you know, get, get visibility on a different level. So for all of those reasons, it started to feel the, like the right thing for me. And I really went you know, even deeper in drawing more fonts, uh, starting to get some custom work, and um, then eventually firing my graphic design clients, uh, which was great. Uh, so, you know, next I'll show a couple of my custom projects, but, you know, my early custom projects, uh, I was fortunate to uh, get to work with Michael Beirut on uh, the nuts.com typeface, which was a great experience, and uh, doing some other logos. Uh, James mentioned on Twitter today, I did the craft logo a while back. Um, I did the Etsy logo. Uh, and those were important, you know, landmarks for me of starting to fill out my portfolio with uh, some bigger recognizable work. 
But one of the first uh, big projects in terms of the number of components, the, uh, the visibility, and the importance that, uh, that meant a lot to me was when I got to start working with Adidas. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so Adidas has been using Adenoia, uh, their brand font, ever since 2011. Uh, it was initially designed by Giancarlo Casasin for um, Sid Lee's All In campaign. And it existed only in lowercase, in three weights. Uh, this is all there was. And I had worked on a small project for Leon Emus, um, creative director uh, in Portland for Adidas uh, previously. I had worked previously with him. Uh, and so he called me and wanted to fill out the family, uh, do some other weights, do some italics, do a condensed, and do some uppercase characters. So I jumped at the opportunity. Um, you know, an initial way that I looked at it was, what is the information we have here from the lowercase? Um, some characters that immediately relate uh, in terms of their construction. Uh, there was also another Adidas font by Tal Lemming called Dribbler. <clears throat> uh, that was used in basketball. And that, that served as information for a lot of the, the proportions and the forms in the uppercase, uh, but there was still lots to fill out. Um, in the end, there were now four weights of Adenoia that also had the, the uppercase. Um, a pretty extreme italic, which I haven't seen used too much, but you know, I'm sure they'll roll it out at some point, <clears throat> with 16 degree uh, angle. Uh, condensed styles, and a full character set that included a lot of alternates. They wanted the, um, the avant-garde, left and right leaning uh, AMVW. There's some narrow caps, some wide caps. Uh, and then in the numbers, there are a couple of alternates, uh, and then a condensed set of numbers that also have additional alternates. <clears throat> um, a little bit later, I added uh, some additional weights, Crazy Light and Ultra Black. Um, I was working with a developer at the time, and he said, you know, I'm not sure Crazy Light is really the best name for it, but it's actually an Adidas product. So, you know, there was a tie-in for them. Um, and another aspect of the Adenoia Pro fonts were some ligatures. Uh, a source of inspiration for the ligatures was the mountain or the badge of sport, the three stripes mark. Uh, using that as this uh, way to slice into the other glyphs, uh, it let them compress the, the, um, the message, uh, make something that feels a bit more like sport to them. So this is just a fraction of the ligatures. These are, these are just the A ligatures, uh, so it goes on from there. But uh, the very first, uh, Usage was this There Will Be Haters campaign, uh, and it was pretty great to see it, you know, used, used prominently, um, looking pretty good, uh, so I was happy to be working with them. Uh, just recently, uh, for, for the uh, PyeongChang Olympics, uh, they were using um, Adenoia Pro with the ligatures. I don't know if you can see that Germany uh, has many ligatures, the R, M, the M, A, the A, N, uh, and can anybody tell me who this gentleman is in the, you know, the older gentleman here? Anyone know? His name is Frank Walter Steinmeier, and he is the president of Germany. I felt very ignorant to learn that Germany has a president. I thought there was just a chancellor. They also have a president. Um, apparently his role is not as prominent, but very important in his own way. Um, Oh, one last image of Adenoia Pro. Uh, it's always fun to encounter the work out in the world, out in the wild. Uh, this was a particularly um, ironic usage where the messages destroy order and we've got an upside down S, uh, no semblance of a baseline, uh, just a complete lack of order here. So, Adenoia Pro was great. It was great to be working with Adidas, uh, working on something that was being rolled out worldwide and used prominently. Uh, but what was even more interesting to me was when uh, they reached out and wanted to uh, work on something that was really drawing something from scratch uh, instead of working with somebody else's intellectual property. So these were some sketches they had done. They wanted an athletic octagonal sands. Uh, particularly for this Adi Zero um, line of products. 
and uh, wanted to work with me to develop that idea further. One initial source of inspiration is this United States Air Force font, uh, which is used for identification on, on the you know, aircraft. Uh, it has the octagonal shape and some really strange proportions, some you know, pretty unique design details. <clears throat> In the design process, I tried to include elements um, from their first sketch, so you know the kind of strange R shape at the top, uh, these Zs with uh, asymmetrical um, you know joins, and uh, also looking at um, you know do we do the octagonal on the inside of the shape or not? Um, another important consideration they wanted, I don't know if you guys can see, but we're doing these facetings. Um, so on the left, there's no faceting on the interior shapes, and then we're adding these little 45 degree moments, uh, which just adds a little bit more visual intrigue when you're using this larger. Uh, we ended up going with the interior faceting, but you know, figuring out exactly what is the radius of that, uh, and not doing the exterior faceting. So same way, weight range as Adenoia Pro, and um, I thought it was great, you know? Here we go, another font, uh, but then they wanted to do some more. So this was the full character set, and uh, Leon had been talking for a long time about uh, making a special extension that would let them, you know, uh, choose from lots of different widths and weights of fonts. This was before variable fonts uh, really existed. So I did a sketch for them, and he said, looks great at the top, love the condensed, but can we make the wide go like three times wider? Uh, which I thought this was already pretty wide, but I said, okay, sure, we'll go just a little bit wider. <clears throat> um, and so that's what we did. Uh, we've got, uh, this is called Adenoia Chop, um, and uh, so full character set on all of these, and uh, you know, quite a, quite a wide range of weights and widths. Um, it looks pretty great when you mix and match them, uh, and you know, really goes from pretty narrow to pretty ridiculously wide. Um, and you know, if you understand what variable fonts are, it allows you to drag anywhere in between uh, the different positions from any of these masters. And the reason that's important for Adidas, you know, sometimes variable fonts are just giving people too many choices, but what they really want to be able to do is fill any space with typography. Uh, another big part of their business are these uniforms um, for colleges, for professional teams, uh, where they need to be able to use a templated system and fill that space with either the number or the team name, the player's name. Uh, and so this becomes a tool for them. So I'm gonna leave the safety of Keynote for a moment and show you uh, a special tool that we made, which, um, so in Illustrator, oh, you guys can't see that, sorry. Oh, I need to, how do I turn my ring off? Okay, I'll just, here we go. All right. Sorry about that. Let me bring these things over. Okay. So this is Adenoia Chop, variable font in Illustrator. Uh, you can change the weight, any weight you want. You can change the width. But um, what's really fun and is this uh, custom plugin uh, which will fill the space uh, with the widest version of the font available. So this was built by Kenneth Ormandy, um, a developer in Vancouver I've been working with. So you just hit the button and instant design. Uh, you know, it becomes even more interesting if you start uh, mixing, mixing the weights around. It's not easy to do behind your back. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a special tool that lets them uh, access the fonts and use them in a way that works for them. Of course, you can access the variable fonts natively in Illustrator, but it just becomes a little bit uh, more unwieldy to go back and forth in this, uh, this drag, drop down. 
And also, if you have multiple fonts, you're not allowed to edit them together, whereas our tool will um, let you uh, change you know, all selected text together. So that's that. And I'm going to come back to Keynote. So. All right. Um, the next project I want to show you is uh, a, a collection of movie fonts that I've worked on for Pentagram for Emily Oberman's team. <clears throat> uh, the first one that I did, uh, you know, I hesitate to show this because there wasn't that much involvement from me, but um, it's part of the story, so I decided to show you, uh, is this Fantastic Beasts font. They had basically crafted the whole alphabet and just looked to me to improve some of the proportions, make it a typo typeable typeface. Uh, as you can see here, it's you know extruded in you know some sort of mercury, you know, uh, glowing metal. Uh, but it was it was a great project in that it was you know used prominently, rolled out worldwide. There were you know all these international versions of the the logo, and it led to um, some other projects that I got to do with them. Uh, the first of which was Justice League, uh, which was the movie that came out last summer. So they had done the logo at the top and then asked me to interpret that as a full typeface. So the first thing I did was kind of an analysis of uh, the font as, or the logo as it was and noticed some inconsistencies that you know, work as a logo but then start to cause problems if you look at it as a typeface. So you can see in the pentagram logo at top, uh, the U's in Justice and League are different widths, and that's because they're justifying this as a lockup, um, in a vertical lockup. So I just made those things more consistent, and in terms of the design process, um, <clears throat> looking at options for uh, from top to bottom, you know, do we go a little bit wider, or from left to right, do we go a little bit heavier? Uh, looking at... Um, a range of character styles for some of the specific characters, uh, trying to use the diagonals as much as possible, so in the B and the R in that second line, um, and then uh, you know selection of the M's and N's, and I'm glad that we did go with the default. Um, it just creates kind of a more of a superhero vibe uh, rather than the more uh, traditional M and N at the bottom. So this was the you know approved character set. Uh, and then we also worked with Ksenia Samarskaya uh, on a Cyrillic. And this is the way I like to uh, talk about um, additional scripts because I don't know what these characters are. You know, I can evaluate them as forms, but when I'm having a conversation with the designer, I don't want to say, um, it's the W with like a little tail at the bottom or uh, it's, it looks like an X, but no, there's a T and it has an H connected to it. It's much easier to just, you know, say number 47. Uh, so this was rolled out and uh, there was a great uh, You Can't Save the World Alone campaign using the fonts. Uh, and <laughs> just saw this recently. Uh, so this is The Daily Show and they parodied the logo for, you know, the Mueller investigation. Um, and they actually use the real font. So this intrigue, it's, you know, the real N there. Um, I'm sorry for showing you his face, but I wanted to show you the Daily Show. Uh, and one more movie font. Just recently, uh, I worked with them on a font for Harry Potter's or J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World. The idea behind this was marrying the two type styles of the Harry Potter logo, which has these, you know, lightning bolts and kind of, you know, crooked little... Um, diagonals, and then Fantastic Beasts, which has these beastly, um, you know, uh, barbs and hair and, um, you know, beastly little moments in it. It was actually a really straightforward uh, design process. Uh, I just showed them, you know, looking at the sketch they had done, how are we going to handle some of these small details in terms of what are the angles on the C's and the S's. Uh, but from there, it was really just, you know, filling out the character set and uh, then working with them to develop uh, the special, um, you know, uh, illustrated versions of the caps. The client ended up killing this part of it. They thought the lightning bolts were too much, so that was the only real edit, was uh, getting rid of the lightning bolts, going to, you know, a bit more consistent on the K, V, W, P, so lightning bolt, no lightning bolt. And I don't have too many uses, images of this in use, so I'll just show you a couple images from my Instagram. 
Uh, these are a bunch of uh, J.K. Rowling's, you know, fantastic beasts, uh, the different words she comes up with for the different animals in her universe. Uh, just a lockup of, uh, you know, the inspiration. And we actually named the font Harry Beast. Uh, Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts. And I think I have to actually click on these for it to start. There you go. All right. Uh, two more projects. Almost done here. Uh, but uh, a big one for me was American Express, um, working with Pentagram, with Abbott Miller's team, also with Andrew Walters and Kim Walker. And... You know, this was this was an important project for me. Uh, from the initial brief, the pro the problem was American Express, this iconic brand, um, has a bit of an inconsistency problem. So there was the blue box lettering, which is this kind of Euro style, uh, you know, outlined type, and then there was the out of the box type, uh, which really had nothing to do with it. Um, it looks a bit stretched. Uh, it's got contrast in a way that the blue box type didn't have. <clears throat> so the most important thing was creating a consistent lettering style that could be used for both. So we looked at a range of options, you know, a narrow range, but a range. Um, so something with a bit more of, uh, you know, uh, not, not humanist, but, you know, more of a constructed um, uh, grotesque approach at the top. Uh, in the middle, something very close to, to the blue box lettering as it was. At the bottom, something more of a geometric uh, construction with the 90 degree terminals at the bottom. We ended up staying pretty close, uh, but looking at, you know, if we do outline the type, how does it work outside of the box? Is it just, is it just the, you know, regular uh, sans serif font, or uh, do we use some sort of outline, some sort of bar system? In the end, this is what we did just for the out-of-the-box font, or the out logo, out-of-the-box logo. And uh, there were some details in it that I thought worked out well. You know, it was a challenge to make that CA ligature not call too much attention to itself, uh, but it was really a bit of a, you know, it, it, was, it was something that the client absolutely wanted. And Abbott had the, the great idea to include the C angle uh, on the S's at the end of Express, which just you know dresses it up a little bit, creates a bit more intrigue in that part of the mark. Uh, but one of my favorite parts of the project was this shorthand, um, what we called Magnify uh, version of the logo. So these were two you know uh, versions that we were presenting. Uh, in the end, we went with the one on the right mainly because the client wanted it to read uh, like an abbreviation of American Express instead of this new word, Amex. Uh, so while there's something formally very nice about the one on the left, the one on the right worked better for their uh, needs. Then working at the blue, on the blue box, uh, we looked at a range of options, including you know, keeping the outline, uh, doing something that were just bars, or rather even removing the outline, but it was something that was important to the client to maintain. So uh, <clears throat> the next step was, okay, if we're gonna outline it, how exactly are we gonna outline it? Uh, the difference between the left and the right uh, is really just the amount of divots that we included. On the left, we've really removed any sort of extraneous detail. And on the right, there's lots of little details, you know, even around uh, at the bottom of the S. So what we ended up doing was removing all of the small ones, but um, some, some on the right were still important, including at the bottom of the R uh, and the shapes around the C. So this is where I, I thought, you know, we had basically solved all the problems. Let's deliver the files. Um, everyone's happy. But it ended up being um, a, a, an interesting project in terms of the way that we solved the, the problem uh, for delivering optical sizes for the font or for the logo. <clears throat> so, I came up with a system, uh, you know, we're looking at the blues and the whites in the logo. Well, how thick is the blue? How thick is the white? So in this grid, going from left to right, uh, I'm increasing the blue weight. You can kind of see the blue is thinner on the le left and heavier on the right, and then increasing the white. So the white is thinnest at the top, um, heaviest at the bottom. I thought, you know, let's show this and we'll pick one and then we'll move on to the next optical size. But it ended up being, 
a, a process of refining, just zooming in and then uh, going even further. So, you know, I have these numbers at the top, 166, 169. So then uh, what the process ended up being was, you know, okay, then we're going to, uh, you know, let's look at 164, 165. Um, and, you know, I show these just because actually I think they're beautiful. It's uh, really cool the way that um, they ended up marking them and, you know, writing these little notes like, yes, uh, it started to get uh, even more fun. And then I knew we were getting close when we started circling things. Um, <clears throat> so in the end, this is what we delivered. Uh, there's three optical sizes for this mark. And, um, you know, the point of an optical size is that they all look the same. But if you look at the smallest one and the largest one side by side, uh, there's quite a bit of a difference in terms of the weight of the white, the weight of the blue, uh, and there's some you know thinning moments that happen, especially in the M uh, on the left. Uh, so these are these are compensations that we do to make it perform correctly. Uh, and then the this Magnify logo, it needed to work uh, at very small sizes. Uh, you know, social media icons. Um, uh, just very small places, so the compensations were even greater for that. Uh, you can really see the, the difference between um, the, the outline on the left and the right. It's basically one-to-one -one in terms of the white and the blue on the left. Uh, so this rolled out just a couple months ago, and I couldn't have been happier with the way that uh, they used all of the assets. Um, I really want that pencil. Uh, and um, I can't wait to get a card. You know, all my cards still, or my, I guess I just have one, but uh, it still has the old logo on it. Um, so soon enough. Uh, after it rolled out, um, it's always fun to read the comments uh, on brand new. Uh, the one thing that I learned that uh, was super interesting is that George Nelson apparently did an American Express logo uh, in 1961. This is what we see at the bottom. Uh, yeah, I did. I did some research at the time, but I, I lost. I missed that detail. So uh, it would have been fun to reference that. Uh, but here it is, just to share. Um, now I'm going to respond to a couple of uh, comments uh, directly. Uh, why not just going this way? Um, great point. We tried it. Didn't work. Um, uh, works so much better. Again, I already addressed this. Client didn't like it. Um, but you know, here. <laughs> Uh, you've got a point. I, I see what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> uh, so in the end, you know, it's not worlds away, but it does work quite a bit better. You know, there were lots of really bad little shapes in the, uh, the previous mark. Um, it didn't work at larger sizes. And the thing that I'm really happy about is um, this out-of-the-box mark. I think it just really, it shines on its own. They're using it large. They're using it uh, really nicely. <clears throat> So one last project that I want to share, uh, which just launched last week, uh, is for Ogilvy. And I did this for Collins, New York, uh, working with Brian Collins, Tom Wilder, and Brian Akarski at Collins. Uh, and then actually we have here tonight Graham Bradley, uh, who helped me with one of the fonts. And Douglas Hayes also helped with uh, one aspect that I'll share a little bit later. So Ogilvy, um, as you may know, Ogilvy and Mather was, or is, um, an ad agency. It was started in 1948, something, in New York by David Ogilvy, uh, a British man uh, who then opened offices around the world. He's really considered the father of modern advertising. And this was uh, the version of the logo that they had used for some time. Uh, it's a custom version of Baskerville. Uh, he was apparently very fond of Baskerville. So that was, you know, going in, we knew that that was uh, a, an aspect that they wanted to maintain. Some, some uh, reference to Baskerville would be honoring his legacy. But more recently, they were using this, this um, signature mark, which, um, you know, had some semblance with his actual handwriting, but uh, there was a desire to move past this to, you know, kind of a return to form. And what was really important in terms of the launch was that Ogilvy had all of these, you know, it's a huge um, company with, uh, in 30 countries, 150 some offices, 15,000 employees. <clears throat> and all of these different, like, you know, marketing companies, different service uh, bureaus that they had, and they wanted it all now to come under this Ogilvy, um, Ogilvy uh, banner. 
So initial, um, initial research, just looking at you know, the Baskerville source material, they had a custom font that they had been using uh, by uh, Storm called Ogilvy J. Baskerville that was you know, incredibly well drawn, uh, beautiful font, but felt a bit old, um, just in terms of uh, looking back towards history. And something that was really important in this project was looking at history, but also having something that was undeniably contemporary. One initial you know, sketch that I did, uh, because there was some mention of maybe there's a sans and a serif was <clears throat> you know, just coming off the Adidas project, I thought, well, what if we make you know, this, uh, this blending tool between a sans and a serif? You know, there was some interest, but it didn't really go anywhere. Uh, what really caught fire, though, was this sketch by Brian Okarski uh, of um, the Ogilvy Mark, which uh, had s some aspects they really liked, um, particularly this, this idea of connection. Uh, as I mentioned, the companies being re reimagined as one single Ogilvy, it had special meaning for them. So my process in terms of seeing this mark and trying to bring some typographic refinement and you know, lead it towards what would work as a final you know, logo was first to look at just evening out some of the proportions, the weight, um, refining some of the curves, and then looking at um, some different options like uh, do we have some sharp details um, in the terminals? Uh, do we maintain this kind of wild swing at the bottom of the G, or do we go with something that's a bit more sober in terms of you know, almost a horizontal on the G? Um, what we ended up doing was somewhere in between, there's still a little bit of a swing on the, on the G bowl, but most of the drama is in that ligature with the GI. My uh, design process, um, looking at uh, the, the Baskerville source material, we looked at a couple of options for the terminals at the top. Uh, they really liked this sharp and round um, play, going much sharper on the details, like on the C in Carson than Baskerville does. There were some parts that, um, that I was a little uncomfortable with, like the, the F and the J, but you know, I've learned to just leave some of these things in there and you know, uh, pray, you know, hope, you know, know that they'll get resolved um, as the project moves forward. So we ended up with something a bit more like the F and J um, with the ball terminals, but maintained some of these sharp details, um, like on the, uh, the tail of the A. Uh, for the italic, uh, looked at source material. Um, uh, I've always really liked the steep italic of Janssen and the kind of play between these different angles in the lowercase. And then this Rosart uh, specimen had some really great details in terms of these like really strange hooks that go into uh, the lowercase characters, like the M and N. <clears throat> so that was an aspect that we, we used, um, especially in the lowercase, uh, trying to create a form that uh, reflected that but worked with the Roman. We looked at uh, a range of options, uh, including uh, you know, from second line, uh, symmetrical hook serifs, so the top of the U and the bottom of the U are doing the same thing. Uh, at the very bottom, a Roman uh, style serif, so it's doing the same thing as what uh, the Roman does in terms of that top uh, flag serif. Uh, and what we ended up with was something somewhere in between the, the second and third option uh, with, um, it still has, uh, it's not completely flat, but it's not uh, symmetrical with the bottom, uh, bottom exit stroke. These are just a couple of the different um, you know, alternates that we looked at, which is just part of, part of the process of figuring out exactly how all of the system works together. And uh, you know, just one note about how this project came to be. Um, Tom Wilder, uh, creative director at Collins, uh, thought of me for this project and had the idea, why don't you come out to New York? Uh, we'll spend a week and we'll really treat it as a boot camp and rapid prototype make as much of this stuff as possible, and I really jumped at the idea. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a great experience of seeing how they work, uh, being able to see the work in use in real time, and uh, adjust, pivot, and uh, make corrections, and make, you know, I think, make the work even better. Uh, at the same time, they, they had a uh, competing uh, design direction, and um, I couldn't help but get a little bit competitive and see they were using this sans serif, and I thought, oh no, the client's gonna choose that one, and then you know, they're not gonna want a font. So 
I actually stayed up almost all night and just pounded out um, you know, a draft of a, of a sans that they could use in the presentation. Uh, and when they chose the Baskerville option, they ended up wanting the sans too. So you know, it's, it's, there's always an opportunity to sell something in. Uh, just some of the alternates that we looked at in terms of designing the sans. And I may lose you on this next slide, but uh, you know, it's a very subtle tweak here. Uh, you know, we just started to think, you know, the, the serif has some very clear special attributes to it. We don't want the sands to just feel like any other sands. So there were some very fine proportion shifts <laughs> going back and forth. You know, just like making the HEFL a little narrower, making some of them a little wider. And, you know, it might not seem like much here, but when you're actually laying it out, when you're actually testing it, um, it ends up feeling uh, different. It doesn't, it doesn't feel as uh, familiar as another font. And that made it, for them, a little bit more ownable. Uh, last few slides here, you know, we made an italic for the, the sands. The serif italic is 22 degrees, which is pretty steep. Uh, it, looked pretty, it looked ridiculous when we did that with the sands, so it's a bit more conservative, something more like 17, which is still pretty, pretty steep for sands. And uh, last few details on this, um, there's also a monogram font that, you know, for some reason I keep doing these, you know, let's do ligatures or monograms. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they're gonna use it, but uh, this was the design process in terms of looking at how the system works and then crafting all of the monograms. So whatever your name is, you know, uh, if you have, you know, hyphenated name, maybe just choose the last two uh, names. But you know, we didn't do the three, uh, the three monogram because that just gets exponentially larger. And this is what Douglas Hayes helped me with. So in the end, we've got um, the family. Um, I'm really proud of the light. I think uh, it does something really nice uh, for the serif, uh, for the sands, and the logo. And what I think really makes this project shine. <clears throat> Uh, Collins is fantastic at uh, executing uh, the design concepts, uh, using it in the real system, and presenting the work in terms of um, you know the way it's photographed. The colors are fantastic, um, and I just really couldn't have been happier with how the whole thing came out. Some books and Ogilvy offices, and I've got one last slide here for you, which is really just type porn. <laughs> Here's the monograms. And in terms of ownership, um, this is something that I retain the rights to. So uh, it will become uh, a public release at some point. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, you know, uh, I, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, the design history as I understand it. Uh, the way that I think about uh, approaching these projects and then showing you uh, a few of my recent projects. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs>